everyone. I'm Anessa Chandra. I'm a PhD student from USC in the Gracie and Neustadt labs. And today I'm going to be talking to you about circadian clocks and giant kelp. So what's so interesting about giant kelp in the first place? One, it's the foundational species for one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the ocean, kelp forests. Um, and this is partially because they are so big. They can grow 15 to 20 meters in one to three years. And this giant structure just allows for a lot of habitat complexity that supports a lot of different types of wildlife. Uh, a lot of these wildlife uh, are actually fisheries that are economically significant for coastal communities. Um, and in general, these kelp forests are really important for industries like ecotourism um, in general. They also provide coastal protection against wave surge, which is especially important as climate change is increasing um, the ocean rise and um, wave action. And they can also provide a lot of chemicals for different resources that we use. Uh, you can find it in ice cream and shampoo um, and for a lot of uh, research purposes. Uh, they have huge potential for uh, being a carbon neutral biofuel, carbon neutral meaning that uh, the amount of carbon that's released during the burning of the fuel is offset by the amount of carbon sequestered during growth. Um, and then research in other seaweeds um, have suggested that adding seaweeds to livestock feed can actually reduce the amount of methane released by livestock like cows. And this, of course, will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and make the uh, agricultural industry a little bit more sustainable. And finally, giant kelp have multiple bioremediation services. Um, because they are photosynthesizers, they sequester carbon during um, that energy acquisition. Because of this, they have suggested to become a pH refuge, uh, which is important since ocean acidification is a real worry for a lot of organisms uh, from you know, your shell builders like mollusks and uh, to your fish who can be really sensitive to uh, the pH or the acidity in the ocean. Uh, giant kelp can also extract a lot of excess nutrients that you can find from runoff, uh, among other things. So why is giant kelp aquaculture kind of growing in the public's eye? One giant kelp is one of the fastest growing organisms in the world, and because of this, it has such a large biomass. It has very minimal input needs. Really, it only needs uh, energy from the sun, sunlight and then nutrients that you can just find in the ocean. And so because of this, it's quite sustainable. Um, you're not gonna exhaust your resources. You can keep just growing it. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of uh, harmful byproducts from the aquaculture itself. Additionally, giant kelp has a large pre-existing biogeographical range. I'll show you a map a little bit later, which means that you can grow it in a great variety of places. Um, it also suggests that they're very adaptive and can acclimate to a large variety of environments. Uh, they are also relatively resilient to climate change, at least in Southern California. So even though they're cold adapted, um, the ocean warming has not uh, so far adversely affected it too much. Um, they, they've been able to recover quite well after extreme marine heat waves that we have been seeing more often these years. Um, but so far, they've been pretty resilient and, and thus probably make a decent investment. So there are a couple of different things we need to uh, successfully domesticate giant kelp so we can have it as an aquaculture crop. One you need is a seed bank to preserve the natural genetic diversity and to minimize harvesting of starting material from the environment. Um, and this is something that my lab, the Nutrition Lab, is working on uh, in collaboration with a lab from Milwaukee. Uh, we want to breed for sterility just so you know your crop doesn't accidentally uh, spread to places that it's not supposed to be. Um, you want to breed for desirable phenotypes like fast growth, biomass, or more carbon sequestration. And you want to correctly match genotypes or the seed stock to the local environment. So this is a map of uh, giant kelp distribution. And so you can see this one species can range from Alaska all the way down to you know, South Africa and Australia. And so just from this, you can tell that it uh, 
exists in a large range of latitudes. And with latitudes, you get a lot of different environmental variables. For example, uh, near the equator, you have shorter summer days. Uh, nearer to the poles, you have longer summer days. And this is especially important for photosynthesizers because uh, you want to be able to photosynthesize the longest time uh, during, uh, during the summer when you have the most light and you have the longest days. Um, other environmental variables that rate can range are temperature and temperature uh, regimes, but also things like water motion. So now kind of moving on to the second part of my talk, the clock, um, let's talk a little bit about chronobiology. So chronobiology is the study of natural physiological rhythms and cyclical processes. Um, it's really focused on the circadian clock, which is the internal biological timekeeping mechanism that uh, supports or keeps these rhythms going. So uh, some examples that you might be more familiar with, uh, some people are morning people, some people are night owls, and this is because of our internal biological clock. Uh, you might experience jet lag from uh, moving across time zones, and that's your circadian clock kind of uh, taking a little bit of time to adjust to your, your new time zone and the differences uh, in your, uh, your especially your daylight and your um, living rhythms. And then just things like your eating and sleeping schedule. So you, you get hungry around the same time, you get tired around the same time. This is all um, due to your circadian clock. Some less familiar examples, but nonetheless important ones are in plants. Uh, the circadian clock in plants uh, determine the timing of daily events like photosynthesis or water use, and also the timing of seasonal events like flowering and leaf fall. And this is really important for crops because obviously we want crops to be able to uh, reproduce and, and to uh, grow for the longest amount of time before harvest and to uh, photosynthesize and grow and just get that most yield that you can. So overall, the importance of the circadian clock is that it allows you to anticipate daily environmental conditions to optimize your bio biological functioning. So uh, an example of this in terrestrial crop domestication can be seen in tomatoes. So in blue, you have your ancestral tomatoes, which originated near the equator, so around zero degrees latitude, which is your shortest day, uh, summer day length. Um, but as you move away from the crater, uh, equator, as your crop has expanded, people start growing them you know, farther north or south, um, you get longer periods or longer, uh, longer circadian clocks. And this is so they can match with the longer summer days. Because so obviously when you have longer summer days, you want your clock to be able to support longer amounts of photosynthesis. And even though circadian clocks can adjust to different environmental conditions when your natural clock uh, matches with the environment around you, then you are able to outcompete other clocks and other, organis and other organisms or other uh, competitors. Um, and so this clock really, especially with photosynthesizers means that you photosynthesize more, you're getting more energy, you're able to grow and you're able to have more yield, which is, um, more biomass here. Um, and that's really what we want, especially when we're talking about uh, agriculture, aquaculture, or uh, crops in general. So in general, the circadian clock has a couple different characteristics. Um, one is that it has free bedding rhythms, which means that they have physiological cycles around 24 hour periods that exist even without cycles of stimuli. So even in complete darkness or you know, constant temperature, you still have these physiological rhythms going. So uh, this is a, perhaps a little bit of a creepy example. If you're, for example, like stuck in an underground bunker for days at a time, you still have your daily cycles, even though you're not getting the cycles of uh, light ne necessarily. You're still gonna fall asleep every 24 hours, you're, you're gonna still get hungry every so often. Uh, another character stuck of this circadian clock is entrainment, which means that the phase is able to be reset based on external stimuli, usually light, temperature, and food or nutrients. And this allows you to adjust your clock to changing day length. And this is basically what's happening when you have jet lag, um, but then you eventually are able to overcome uh, the differences between the time zones. 
And finally, you have temperature compensation, which means that you are able to keep a consistent rate for your timekeeping mechanism across a temperature range. And this is important because, um, you know, simple physics, as temperature increases, uh, rate of reaction increases, and you, you don't want that to happen with your clock. You want to be able to keep a steady rhythm um, despite anything that's happening um, outside your control. So the circadian clock is made out of three different elements. The first is input pathways, which adjust the clock based on environmental information, such as light, temperature, and nutrients. Then you have your core oscillators, which are your genes and proteins that pretty much keep uh, the time and maintains the cycles, even without uh, the outside information. And then finally, you have output pathways, which uh, allows core oscillators to regulate other physiology, like water use or photosynthesis, uh, you know, feeding and whatnot. So this is a little diagram over here. You have your input pathways, you get light, uh, temperature, nutrients, um, and they're telling uh, these core oscillator genes or clock genes to turn on or off. Um, and these are going to be transcribed and translated into proteins, uh, which create a negative feedback loop and can go back and uh, inhibit the transcription and translation of uh, their own genes, or they can uh, go and regulate your clock output pathways, um, which can also create products that uh, go back and create another negative feedback loop and uh, regulate your genes or your core oscillators. So that part is called the transcriptional translational feedback loop or TTFL clock. Um, but there are other types of clocks like the redox clock where you don't go through transcription and translation, but uh, it just happens to be cycles of protein modifications, but we won't get that into that too much. So what am I actually doing? So my research is determining the existence of the circadian clock in giant kelp, because although you know a lot of organisms all across the tree of life have circadian clocks, and they all pretty much uh, consist of interlocking loops, the exact components or proteins or genes for those loops differs from organism to organism. Uh, so Part of this is going to be identifying clock genes and mechanisms, investigating input stimuli for the clock. So is the giant kelp clock set by light, temperature, nutrients, uh, studying existing circadian variation in giant kelp populations. So along that uh, giant latitudinal gradient, uh, do you have longer clocks in higher latitudes and shorter clocks in near the equator? Uh, then I want to quantify the effects of the circadian traits or circadian phenotypes on desirable traits like biomass, photosynthesis, uh, growth rate. And then I want to construct a breeding plan for enhanced performance based on these clock traits. So this summer, I'm mostly focusing on these first three points. And this is uh, an example of uh, a kelp blade that I've sampled uh, using a little circular blade cutter. So why am I doing it here on Catalina? Uh, so Catalina is home to numerous giant kelp beds, has a long history of giant kelp research, and there's still current research that's really excited and actually uh, very closely related to my project. For example, the Kelp Elevator Project, um, which is being done by Diane Kim and Andy Neverett. Um, and I won't go really much into it, but that's a cool project. If you have time, you should look that up, or you can contact me and we can talk about it. Uh, and so that's pretty much it. I just want to thank all the hardworking staff at Wrigley and my REE student, Janelle. Uh, they've really made my project possible. And if you have any questions or you want to chat, you can contact me at this email address right here. Thank you.